Hi everyone, my name is Hod Rotem, an evangelist uh, for K2View. Um, so thank you all very much for joining our uh, second developer community meetup of the year. Um, for those who are new to this uh, discussion, this is a very technical oriented discussion. We talk about how things are implemented and built in K2View, how things run uh, behind the scenes. Uh, in today's session, we're going to talk about uh, triggers, CDC, Elasticsearch integration. I want to remind the team that, that um, we have a few useful links that we're going to share with you. In fact, we're going to post them right now on the chat. These are links to some very important information. Um, it says last time you can um, go simply to our support site where you can see a lot of different and important information. You can see academy information, we can get trained on our product, a knowledge base where you can find very detailed information about how to use our uh, platform. In fact, everything that we're going to cover today has very detailed information in the knowledge base. We're going to share this information throughout the meeting or at the end of the meeting, so you have links that uh, will go to what we discuss. Um, additionally, there's the community section here. Um, this allows you to see previous we uh, webinar, among other things, also allow you to ask questions. We are going to take questions at the end of this uh, session. For those who did not ask questions or uh, we didn't have time to cover them, feel free to go into our Q&A session and ask. We'll make sure to address this. Okay, all of this, again, is made available via support at k2view.com or support.k2view.com. Okay, so I mentioned today's session is around triggers, um, CDC and Elasticsearch. As always, we're not going to spend a lot of time on slide. Uh, in fact, I think other than the agenda, we might have a couple more slides uh, throughout the entire session. Um, and we're going to dive in. We're going to teach you how to implement and configure triggers uh, in K2View event triggers, which is a form of a trigger. Uh, change data capture, CDC, as well as integration with Elasticsearch. Um, if we have newcomers to the world of K2View, uh, you might uh, not be aware that K2View manages different uh, data differently. Uh, instead of the traditional, here's a big table of millions of customers, and here's a big table of tens of millions of addresses, and etc. We manifest the data in what we call logical unit or data products. Essentially, we manifest the data from a business perspective. So we will collect all the data that belongs to a business unit, in our case, a customer, from all the different systems and applications and technologies. And we manifest this data from a business perspective. We keep this information sync. We also deliver this data to other applications. Some of the, the functionality we'll talk about, specifically CDC, is aimed at how we do this type of delivery. And we can also expose the data. Uh, a consumer of data can come to K2View and say, give me information about a customer. Uh, in our previous developer community meetup, this is what we discuss: how to build web service using Graphite, our no-code drag-and-drop uh, web service designer. Um, if you're interested, you can go back to our website uh, or through YouTube and see this uh, session. Okay, so this is where we get started. Uh, um, in our example, we have already built a data product. It's called Customer. Here is the schema definition for that customer. We already brought data from CRM, billing, and asset, three different databases, three different technologies managed by different vendors. In today's session, we'll talk about how to define triggers, events, and CDC on top of the data that is brought into uh, K2View. So our first uh, topic is triggers. Uh, for those who have worked with triggers in other databases, this is essentially exactly the same. Triggers are pieces of code that are executed automatically when a change happened to a data inside the, da the table that the trigger is defined on. So, more specifically, uh, triggers are executed when there's inserts, updates, or deletes to the data in the table. So in our example, we want to add a trigger to the address table that will update and populate information in another table that we prepared in advance called address history. 
If we look at the address history table, and let me categorize this so it's easy for us to remember. The address history table has a few simple information. The address ID, the unique identifier of the address that is being changed, the state that the customer lives in, the operation, whether it was an insert to the data, an update to the data, or delete, and the time that it happened. Uh, now, if you have worked or if you are working on the .NET uh, version of our studio, this is the exact same functionality. When we want to define a trigger on a table, we will open the table definition. There is a section here called on change. We will add one or multiple triggers. And similar triggers, again, are pieces of code that are executed. If I look at the trigger table function, It's a function, it's code that is executed when the data changes. So in the exact same manner, in the new in the new web studio, you can also define these triggers on the table definition. I will select the address uh, table. I will go to the table property and there's a section called trigger where I can add the functions that I want to be triggered when data changes. Naturally, you can have more than one and take care of the order. Um, and again, these are pieces of code. If if we look at this function trigger table, let's search for it in our in our code. You can see that this is a regular function. It's defined and ta tagged as a trigger function, which is why you can see it here in the drop down. But it's a function that will work on top of the data. How you define these functions in one of various way. You can create a new trigger function. You might choose to use our command palette. This is a very useful uh, feature in the uh, web studio. We can just search for what it is that you want to do. Uh, even if you already have code available, you can use helpers. Type in fabric. You get a list of examples. Here is an example of a trigger. You just select it, and it automatically creates the structure for you. It's very useful for any time you want to develop a code. It gives you this helping examples of how code can be generated automatically. So this is our function. It's called trigger table, um, and it's eventually going to insert data into this new address history table that we added here. Now, it's going to insert the address ID, the state, the operation, and the time. The time is actually generated directly when we run the insert command, uh, but the address state and operations are taken from the input to the function, which is automatically generated, uh, uh, argument called table data change. They will hold information about, um, about the data that had changed, about the role that had changed. So we're gonna add a breakpoint here. Uh, we haven't had a chance to um, to actually work with Java in this session before, so we're going to add a breakpoint, and we're actually going to debug this uh, Java code. If you are working on the .NET version, you can use IntelliJ for that purpose. In the web version, this is built into the product. You can just click the debug function, and now it will give you all the standard functionality of dive in and out and run and etc. Now we have added our table, we added a trigger to the address table. Let's simulate using our table data viewer what happens when we synchronize data into K2 view. So in this example, I'm going to bring customer number one into K2 view because customer number one doesn't exist right now in K2 view. It will start populating the data. The address data will be populated. Um, as a result, there will be a new row into the address table, which will execute the trigger function. So when I click execute, it starts bringing the data and it automatically moves me to my breakpoint. And here I can interact with the data. First, I can see that this element, this table data change that was provided for me includes a lot of very useful information. For one, it includes the fact that the data is inserted. The type of the operation is insert. We're bringing new data. Here are all the columns that are part of the 
the table that are updated. And there are two very important sections, the new values and the old values. Insert brings new information in. So under the new value section, I will see all the information. That person lives in Kentucky. Old values is naturally empty because we brought in new information. If the operation was an update as opposed to an insert, we'll do in a second, the old values will have the old information that the customer had and the new information would have the new information that the customer had. If the information is or the action is delete, there is no new information in delete. We're taking the old data and deleting it. So depending on the operation, you might get different information in different uh, elements in the in the argument. And that's why here in row 33, we're actually checking if the operation is delete, I'm going to bring the data from the old values. There is, not, there is no new values. And if it's either insert or update, I'm going to bring the data from the new value. And this is the data that I'm going to use to insert into the table. Now, I'm going to click the play continue. And again, here you can step over and into and out and all the wonderful debugging functionality. I'm just going to click continue here and it will run the rest of the code. I'm still in debug. I'm still attached to the debug. But if I go back here and I look at my history table, I can see that the trigger inserted a new row for address ID number one, the state is Kentucky. It's an insert operation and here's the time that is inserted. Now let's change the sync mode here to off because I wanna run a few more updates on the data and I don't wanna sync it from the source system. So now every time I execute, I'm not actually syncing the data from the source. I'm just looking at the data that we have in k 2 Now I wanna update the data in the address table right now. And there are different ways you can do it, but the one that I personally like the most is an option or a module called Data Explorer that allows you to see the data in k 2 view and edit it from a visual perspective. So I'm gonna go to the customer data product. That's the one we're working on. And I'm gonna look at the address table and I'm gonna look at the data for customer number one. Okay, so here is the address that was brought for customer number one. We can see that the state that he lives in is Kentucky. Let's go ahead and edit this. I'm gonna change the, uh, the uh, state to Texas. I'm from Texas and I'm gonna run the update operation. And now I'm simulating changing the data inside the logical unit. And because my debug is still running, the breakpoint was which, now the table data change has an update operation on it. Here it is. And because it's an update, I have the old values that shows that that person used to live in Kentucky. And I do have the new values that showed that he now lives in Texas. Okay, so we've seen a little bit how easy it is to debug and, and operate on top of that thing, uh, on top of trigger functions. Let's continue the execution and let's actually stop the debugging. We understand how debugging works here. We don't, uh, we don't need to uh, run that again. So now because I completed the, the synchronization of the update, I can see that the Texas entry was updated uh, into uh, the system. Now, it's very important to understand that trigger functions are actually part of the synchronization transaction. That means that if something happens during that function, it rolls back the entire transaction. And we're going to simulate this. We're going to hard code throwing an, ex uh, an exception. Um, notice a few hyphens and the word exception. I'm just generating an exception inside the trigger function. And I'm going to deploy this change because I've made a change to the code and I wanted to take. And now I'm going to go back and try to change Texas to, let's say, Puerto Rico. Now, because I triggered the exception, I'm getting the notification. I'm also seeing that the data in the logical unit had not changed. It's still showing Texas. And naturally, if I look at my history table, I'm not going to see that operation because the trigger function caused an error which rolled back the entire, um, the entire synchronization. Okay, so the point here is that 
triggers are actually executed as part of the transaction itself. Now, we've seen how simple it is to write code that will insert and update information in the logical unit. Um, you, you don't actually have to use code if you prefer a more visual approach. You can actually, let's comment this out. And let's actually call a Broadway function. So in this case, our Broadway is called address history. Let me open it. While it's opening, let's just notice that we're passing to the Broadway the entire table data change argument. In other words, I can do all of the functionality that I do in coding, but now in a visual way where I can see the data flowing through the different actors and activities. Let's save the Java here. Let's deploy a customer and let's make another change from Texas to Puerto Rico again. An update. And now we can actually see how the data flows through the different actors. I get visual indication of the data. Here's the old data he used to live in Texas. Here's the new data. He now lives in Puerto Rico. And I can drag and drop and create all this functionality instead of writing code. Similar to here, how we checked if the type is delete and if it's delete, we use the old values. Otherwise, we use the new values. Same functionality. If it's delete, use the old values. If it's not delete, use the new values. Here's the new values taken from the new entries and the old values are taken from the old values. And the beauty of this is that now you have the entirety of Broadway to manipulate and operate on top of data. If you want to write to a file, bring an actor that writes to a file. If you want to call an API, call an API. If you want to publish and subscribe, publish and subscribe. If you want to call a database or write to a database, do so. In fact, you can even use a trigger to update the data in a source system as part of the transaction of K2 view. In other words, if you weren't able to update the data in the source system, you won't be able to update the data in K2 view as well. It will roll back the entire transaction. Now, there's other more effective ways of doing that, specifically CDC that we'll talk about later in the presentation. That's something that is enabled as part of the functionality. Okay, so now the Broadway was executed. Here's the new entry, and now you, you can use Broadway and we'll have separate sessions on Broadway. Um, it's a visual way to interact with data. Instead of writing code, you can drag and drop functionality. There's a lot of built-in actors and functions that you can utilize instead of developing your own. Okay. So we did a few inserts and updates operation. Let's also run a delete operation. It's the same thing. Instead of changing one of the columns, I'm going to delete this entire row and I'm going to click update. And now Puerto Rico, which was my last entry, was deleted. OK, so triggers are events that are executed when data in the table changes specifically insert, update, or delete operation. So now because we deleted the entry in the, uh, the address table, the address table should be empty, I'm not saying it. Okay, if you have any questions around trigger, please note them down in the chat. Uh, we will uh, try and address them uh, after we cover the rest of the topics. Okay, so that was the first entry, triggers. Triggers is mainly used to keep data integrated across the different LUs. You might even use triggers to update data in the original source system if you wish for, even though there are much easier ways and more effective ways of doing that. One of that is CDC that we will cover today. Now, an event trigger is a variation of a trigger. It's a type of a trigger that instead of running on the table itself, an event trigger runs on the entire data product. So to define it, instead of standing on a specific table and looking at the triggers here, you would select anywhere in the main schema screen to see the schema properties. And here you have the ability to define event uh, uh, functions. Now, there are three types of event triggers. One that runs when the synchronization is successful. Another one that runs when the synchronization fails. 
and another and a third one that runs when a delete of an instance of a unit is successful. And for each one, you can assign a piece of code to run. Now, these are exactly like a regular trigger. In, in, in fact, if I go and search for one of these function, customer event, you can see here that I have the three function, sync successfully, sync failure, and delete uh, uh, successfully. They're just tag as an event function, meaning if you wanted to create a function of type event, you will just do so. Um, and all three are actually calling uh, another internal function called instant activity that will insert the data into a new table called data product activities. So this table is defined under our common or reference uh, unit. So here is under referent, here are the list of tables, and here is this table that we defined. Um, and you'll be able to see that it's um, straightforward. The data product that trigger the change, in our case, customer, the identifier of the unit, the customer ID, the operation, and the time that it was executed. Now, the operations will be passed depending on the event itself. If it's successful, then it will say sync successfully, otherwise it will say failed, or if it's delete successfully, it will say delete successfully. And very similar to trigger function, you can also call Broadway instead of writing code if you wish to. So we're going back to our schema. We update uh, this uh, three um, uh, event. We're gonna save, we're going to deploy. Now, before I synchronize the data, let's go back to our data explorer. And this time, instead of going to the customer data product, we'll go to our reference and search for the data product activity and notice that this table is empty. Okay, we haven't yet populated that with information. So now I can sync the data. Let's take again customer number one and run a new operation. New essentially means if I already have an instance of customer number one in K2 view, I'm gonna first delete it and then I'm gonna sync it again. So same thing will happen. You will see that customer number one already exists. It will delete it, which will trigger a delete instance notification. And then it will create a new one, which will trigger a sync successfully operation. And that means that now in our table, we should see these two sections. Here's the delete that happened first, and a few milliseconds after the sync happened successfully, and we can see this information. So you've already seen that event triggers are a very effective way to audit the behavior of the data products. You can also use them to trigger external event. When we delete something from K to view, delete the instance K to view, delete it from a different location, or maybe send an email and notify that it was deleted. Okay. We talked about the fact that in triggers, when a failure happened in the trigger, it rolls back the entire transaction. In events, the failure will actually be audited. So I'm going back to the trigger function that we created, and I'm going to, again, out code the, the throw of the exception. Then I'm going to go back to the schema, and I'm going to Try and bring customer number two in. Now, because I uncommented the exception, we're getting the exception back in, but unlike trigger that rolled back and didn't run anything even in the trigger, the event function will audit that customer number two failed during synchronization. So it still executed, even though there might have been a failure in the synchronization itself. Okay. The last item, we, meaning we've seen here the three items, delete, sync, successfully, and sync, sync, failed. However, we ran delete together with the sync, so let's run delete by itself. First, let's comment back the exception. We don't want it to throw an exception. And then we want to run a delete operation on the entire instant. To do so, I like using the admin module. And the admin module 
allows me to see all the commands among many other things, all the commands that can be executed um, on, a, on the platform. One of these operations is delete. Um, so let's see how, how to use the uh, delete um, uh, operation or delete command. I'm going to type in help delete instance and it will give me information around how to actually execute the delete command. So in our case, we simply write delete instance, our data product and the instance that we would like to delete. We're going to run execute. And we're going to come here and validate that the delete of customer number one was actually executed successfully. And that means that right now in K2 view, we don't actually have any instances. Number one was deleted and number two failed during execution. So essentially K2 view is empty, right? Okay, so this is an event trigger, very similar to a regular trigger. It runs on the entire uh, instance synchronization. Uh, also manifest as a piece of code that executes depending on the type of synchronization that happened. If you have any questions around um, event triggers, kindly write them down in the chat. Uh, we'll again address them at the end of the uh, session. Okay, <clears throat> so we talked about triggers and, we, and, and uh, event triggers. Uh, let's move and talk about CDC. So, Triggers were meant to keep data integrated across the logical unit. CDC, which change, stands for Change Data Capture, is meant to notify and synchronize external system. It's the same concept. When data changes, we want, in this case, to notify an external system that the data had changed. Now, the way that K2 view manifested, it is by publishing messages into a queue with the changes. Essentially, every time there is an insert, update, or delete, and by the way, we'll see that it's not just the DML, the data manipulation language operation, but it also schema changes are published. It pushes the data into a topic in a Kafka queue. Now, where are those topics defined? Those topics are defined in our main configuration file. The file that ends in K2 project, every project has one of these files. It's the exact same file if you're working on the .NET version. So you might go here and open folder, and here's the K2 project file. And in the K2 project file, you have this section here that essentially defines what are the different topics that we want to publish into. Now, the search topic is built into the product. This is a reserved topic that we use for integration with Elasticsearch. We will talk about that next. But for the purpose of this meetup, I created or I defined two new topics, data lake and real-time events. And these represents two consumers of the data, two groups that want to consume data every time it changes in K2View. Now, where are those topics created and what is the Kafka that we publish the data to? Let's define in another configuration file called config and I. Um, and then there's a few sections here. We're, we're gonna uh, talk about how K2View handle pu publication and subscription of queues in another session. There is a very advanced functionality around this. Um, but you can see here that I define in a table, in, in a section called default pub sub, um, that I'm going to post the data into Kafka, and here is my Kafka information and security and users and password and all that information. Now, because I defined it in the default pub sub, that means that every object or every module in K2View that uses Kafka will use it from the default. In fact, common or reference is another object that uses Kafka in K2View. So if you remember the table data product activity that we load the data to, because I defined it to use Kafka, if I go and look at all the topics that were created in Kafka, and what we're seeing here is just the client that shows me all the topics that we have in the Kafka that we're connected to, 
you can see that one of the topics is the one that was designed for the data product activity table. If I wanted common to write to a different Kafka, I can just update this here in this section and similar to CDC, if I wanted the CDC to publish to a different uh, Kafka, I could update that in the relevant um, uh, uh, group in the config and location. Now, it's important to mention that for development purposes, you don't actually have to use Kafka. You can use an option called memory, um, where K2 view will mimic the behavior of Kafka internally in its memory. In other words, you can still publish and subscribe and create CDC and do Elasticsearch integration, we'll talk about next, without actually having a real Kafka. And naturally, that's for development purposes, not for a project or real time environment. So, where are those two topics, or actually three topics that we created? If I go back to Kafka, I'm not actually seeing that. And that's because K2View, the platform, knows to generate them when we're being asked when we actually need to work on top of the data. And I haven't yet defined any CDC, so it hasn't created um, any of the topics. So let's do that. Let's go back into our um, schema and let's add CDC definition to the customer table. Again, on the table level, on the table property, similar to where we had trigger before, now we also have a data change index location where I see the three topics and I can define CDC. Now what's really nice about it is that you can define CDC on the table level and you can define it on the column level. Unlike trigger that runs on the entire table, in CDC you can define for specific consumers what data they will actually see. So I can define that the data lake team will see only these three columns, but the real-time event team will see other columns. Now this option here of the type we'll talk about when we talk about search, it's something that is relevant to Elasticsearch. Okay, so all I'm doing is defining for the customer table, a CDC to a topic called data lake, and that CDC will only have these three columns. The customer ID, the um, um, ID number, which is the social security number and the email. So I'm gonna save this, control S, and now I'm just gonna deploy the customer data product. And doing so will automatically have created the topic for me because now we need to use the data. Now clicking this magnifying glass button here opens what's called a consumer which is just simply state it, it, it consumes any data that is published into the Kafka message. So anytime Fabric will publish any information through the CDC, I will see that information here on the screen to help us see how Fabric reacts in different scenarios. Okay, so now that we defined our first CDC, let's go back to our data explorer. Let's go to the customer logical unit or data product. Let's look at the customer table. And remember, right now, K2View doesn't have customer number one. So I'm going to fetch customer number one and sync the information. And this will bring the data into K2View and will automatically publish the CDC event on the customer table that we defined. If I look at the information of the record that was published, we can see that it's a data change event and it's on the customer table. And we can see that here are the three columns that we publish and here are the values. Very similarly to how Trigger worked, we have a section called all values and a section called new values. We just inserted a new type. There wasn't any data before, so there is no old values. There is only new. However, if I change the data in K2View and let me close this and I'm going to Type uh, or hit this clear button. So every time, you know, we, we see very easily when new events are generated. I'm going to go back here and I'm going to change one of the columns that were defined in the CDC. We right now for this consumer, we only define customer ID, ID number, and email. So let's change the email address from Tali to Tali Griffin. And I'm going to click the update. 
and this will update the data into K2View and will publish a new CDC event to Kafka. And in this CDC event, now we see that the type is update. And now we have the old values and the new values. Here's her email address before. Here's Tali's email address after. Now, what would happen if I change a column that is not one of the columns in the CDC definition? Let's change the Facebook um, ID. The data will update in K2View. But because there is no CDC definition on it, there will be nothing to publish. And that's to say that K2View actually compares the records, the before and after, and only sends CDC events if there was a change to the definition or to, to, to the value of one of the columns that are defined. Okay, let's, let's get a little bit more advanced than that. Let's go back to the Sorry. let's go back to the uh, definition of the um, uh, CDC for table customer and let's add a new column. Let's bring the primary form. Okay, so again, all I'm doing is clicking save and deploying the logical unit again. But see what happens. I actually got a few messages. One that tells me that there was a change to the schema and we added a new text field called primary font. So unlike triggers that only works on DML, data manipulation language, insert, updates, and delete, CDC actually works on DDL, data definition language as well, when the definition changes. Another one of the, the um, uh, messages that were automatically created is notifying the consumer hey, because I made a change to the schema for customer number one that you already had the data to, please delete the information because I'm going to send you a new one. And the third one is reproviding the data for customer number one that includes the primary phone. So this is to say that K2View automatically republishes CDC event when the schema changes. You don't have to manually trigger those activities. You don't have to worry about, did I synchronize the event or not? It automatically does that. It's a, a process called republishing. In fact, if you wanted to do that manually, you could. Similar to how we had an example of a delete function, there's also functions that are dedicated to CDC. This republish instance will republish customer number one. So if I execute it and go back here, here I just created a new event that publishes customer number one with the primary phone information. There's another one here called republish schema. Republish schema will republish the schema definition of the customer data product. So click in execute. And now I get the definition. Under the customer data product, there's a table called customer that has these fields in the schema of the CDC, including the primary key. Okay, so this. I have a question. question. I have a question, please. Yes, go ahead. I have a question, please. And if I, if I have a two million rows and I change the schema, the CDC, it's it's like a three six million now fired. Outside, uh, so a lot but of you can control. Yes, you can control it. This is a great question, by the way. There is a built-in parameter. Let's let's look at it. Help set CDC publish that allows you to disable whether CDC events are triggered. So if you're making a schema changes and you know that it's gonna create a huge republishing, which by the way still happen in an efficient way. It's distributed across the, the fabric cluster and, and you know, multi-threads to make it more efficient. But if you're worried about the event and you want to schedule it to an, another time, you can use the CDC publish and set it to false, and that will not trigger the CDC event and will not cause the republishing. Great question. Thank you. Okay. So hey, uh, one more question here. Um, 
So the CDC flag that you have set to false, right? Um, so uh, I'm assuming this is more real time, right? As and when the change happens, you publish it. Uh, is there any way I can go and go back in time and then republish an event or, or a change that I've done before? You, you can republish the entire instance. So yes, you can republish data that has already been republished before, if you want to. Okay. Okay. So we talked about CDC a little bit. Um, when we talked about trigger and event trigger, we also saw what happens when there is an exception. And this is also very applicable um, to CDC because there's some advanced functionality that K2View has around how we handle exception. So I'm going to go back to the trigger function, the one that we assigned on the address table, and I'm going to put back the exception. And I'm going to try, let me just make sure that I clear here. Good, I clear. And I'm going to try to sync customer number two. Now, as this happened, let me just remind you that the CDC is defined on customer number on the customer table. And the customer table actually runs in order one before address is executed. And which means the CDC event will happen here and then the trigger will run here and will fail. So if I execute this, first I get the exception. But the beauty is that the event wasn't actually published. Why? Because K2View actually manages a transaction in Kafka. So even though the error occurred after we published the customer information, we're still able to roll back the, the uh, data. Um, now, this is where, depending on what version of Fabric you work with, it might be manifested in a different uh, way. If you're working on version 6.5, you might have noticed that there's an um, internal or hidden a topic called CDC topic, where we use to hold all the information until the transaction, until the synchronization is successful, and then we publish it to the real topic. In Fabric 7, this is managed using Kafka transactions, so we, you don't, we don't need this CDC topic anymore. It's managed automatically by the system. Okay, let's comment out the exception. And now let's add another CDC real quick. Uh, we already added one to the customer, and if I wanted, I could add the second real-time consumer here as well. Let's add this to the activity table instead. So same concept, go to the table uh, data change index. Uh, let's add here uh, an event uh, or a CDC. Uh, let's bring the activity ID and activity date, and again, we'll talk about this in a second when we talk about Elasticsearch, and I'm going to save. And before I deploy, I'm going to go back to my Kafka client and I'm going to show you that again, there are only seven topics. None of them are the topic for the real time event. So all I'm going to do is deploy because the republish is set to true. Two things would have happened. First, the new topic was added. And second, if I look at all the events that have happened since the last hour, you will be able to see that similar to the republish that we had when we changed the data lake structure, CDC structure, now that I added a new definition to the customer number one to the CDC, I get the same three messages. With the schema changes, this time we added an activity. Um, if you already had the data deleted for the activity table for customer number one, and here are the one activity, sorry, one activity that customer number one has. So again, the republish happens automatically even when you add new uh, CDC definition, new uh, uh, topics, not just to the existing ones. Okay, last but not least, let's finally bring in customer number two. Give us a little bit of space here. And customer number two, notice, has 10 activities. You can see here the number 10 for this table, uh, starting from activity ID 2 all the way to activity ID 11. So I would expect to see 10 different messages that are being broadcast to the CDC. Uh, most likely the last one would be ID 11. And that's to say that it doesn't just handle individual inset, it's whatever data had changed during the, um, uh, the last event. 
Okay. So we talked about the standard CDC. Let's talk about Elasticsearch, which is a variation of uh, CDC, essentially a use case of the CDC. We mentioned before that there is a built-in um, topic called search for CDC. And really behind the scenes, it still manifests in the exact same way. It publishes to a topic called search, but there is a built-in process in K2 to view that consumes the data from that search topic and updates Elasticsearch. Now, how does that process know which Elasticsearch to update? That is done by defining a new interface of type search. And this interface name has to be called lowercase search. You can define other Elasticsearch interfaces if you wanted, but to utilize this integration, this built-in integration, you have to use the uh, uh, um, interface called search. Okay, so I'm going to test connection, make sure that I put in the right information here. The connection here is okay, and I'm going to save it. And now the process knows that when it needs to publish to or, or to move the data to Elasticsearch, it uses that interface to do so. Now I could go back to the customer and I could add the search definition. In my case, we prepare the table in advance called customer search. I'm going to add that to my schema. And I'm going to group it, um, call it Elasticsearch, so it's easy for us to remember. And what this table does, is that it runs in order 50 after all the rest of the table has been have been populated and it collects information from the different tables includes some basic information from the customer the social security first name last name email phone as well as some address information um here as well so it will run after the um the uh lu was populated and i'm going to save it and similar to what we've done before I'm going to deploy it. And now a new topic was created, search, as well as in Elasticsearch, and the, the tool that I'm using now is called Kibana. It's a, it's a visual client to Elasticsearch. You can see that before we only had six indexes. Now we have seven. K2 view already created the place in Elasticsearch where the data will be stored. Now I can go and start syncing the data, or I can use the republish functionality. I can also just run a batch operation. Let's do that. Let's go to the admin, go to the batch section. Um, if you're not familiar with batch, you can you can uh, learn a lot on our support site. We will have another session that talks about this functionality. I'm going to uh, select the customer data product and I'm going to bring all the customers that I have in the source system. Select distinct customer ID from main customer, and I'm going to run it. And I'm going to view the monitor here to see the progress. So it's already loaded 14 out of the 100 that we have in this environment. Here's 33. And that means that now Elasticsearch will have data for my from K2 view. Here is this data in, in Elasticsearch called customer search. And I can see that it already brought the 100 customers that I had in the source system, and the information is now indexed in Elasticsearch. That means that my batch here had completed. Now, why is that very important? It's important because now you can leverage all of Elasticsearch functionality in K2 view. And for those who are not familiar with Elasticsearch, it's a very, very advanced uh, uh, capability to search data in a very effective way. And here's an example of me running a query, a command on top of Elasticsearch. And the beauty is that now, when you define this CDC to Elasticsearch in integration, you have a built-in command called search in K2 view, where you can execute those commands. In other words, you can run a command in K2 view that will utilize Elasticsearch information. So here, 
I prepared a few examples. Let's run this one. This command will bring everyone that whose last name is Griffin, but notice that I misspelled the word Griffin. I forgot the I. It still found it though, because Elasticsearch, among other things, allow you to define fuzzy. It's almost like a Google type search. Again, very advanced type of search capability. Let's uh, bring this one here. This one will bring everyone who lives in New York that their first name is either Ruth or Lida. Okay. Now, why is that so important? It's important because now you can utilize it in different modules in K2View. For example, you can use it in web services. If you remember from our developer community session last time, that's that's what the web the the meetup was about. We talked about how to define web service with this visual drag and drop type of a designer without needing to write code. And in our example, we have a web service called Get Customer Info that wants to return customer information from the customer instance, but it needs the customer ID, and it doesn't have it. So it uses search on top of Elasticsearch to bring the customer ID based on the customer's social security number. So let's debug it. Let's go here and let's take this social security number from our example and let's debug this functionality. And now the web service will use Elasticsearch, will find the customer ID using the, the social security or any advanced Elasticsearch command that you want and we use that to bring the information uh, to the web service. In other words, it gives you a very powerful functionality to allow you to get data on top of K2View without having the specific ID of the unit that you want to work on. It's also very useful when you wanna build reports. In the new web studio, we added a report module that allows you to build reports essentially using drag and drop type of functionality. And in this report, you can see that I have defined a search command that will bring all the customer based on the state. So an input to the, to the report would be at state and you will bring all the customers that are part of that state. And now that we build this report, we can execute it. And here are all the customers from New York, all the customer from Texas, and customer from California. In other words, it's a very uh, you know, useful feature to enable you to build reports that span across all the data, not just individual unit. Okay, I have okay. a question here. Um, yes, sir. So um, can, can we expand Elasticsearch to do complex queries like joins uh, across tables or something like that? Um, in, uh, in this current version, uh, the search function in K2View allows you to, to join between different tables in the same LU, but the, the, a much more efficient way of doing it is similar to how we've done it here um, in the uh, customer search. Because joins are very complex, in Elasticsearch, all we did here is we defined, we utilized Broadway to bring data across the different elements here. And essentially we created an index that included all the attributes that we wanna enable search based on. Okay, okay so here's the query that we executed. We executed it across, you know, on the data in the LU and it joins data between customer and address and bring some customer information and address information. And that means that you have a very visual way to create those definition without worrying about the complexity of how you join the data in Elasticsearch. So my, my, my LU has to be designed in such a way my joins are self-included uh, within that LU that I'm looking for. That, that would be the recommended approach, yes. Okay, got it. Okay, so guys, we're four minutes to the hour. Um, 
let me just run a quick summary. Uh, we will also share links to all of these uh, four uh, topics that we discussed. Uh, so you can go directly to our support site or to our documentation and, and learn more. We talked about triggers and event triggers, uh, which are mostly used to maintain data integra integrity across the data product, uh, executed on inserts, update or delete that happen to the table that the trigger is defined on. Event functions or event triggers are executed in the entire logical unit instance, whether the synchronization of it was successful, failed, or, uh, or the delete was successful. And we talked about CDC, which is meant to keep external system up to date with data that change in K2 view. And Elasticsearch being one of its use case where we have a built-in functionality that will take the data from the CDC event and synchronize it into Elasticsearch, enable us to use Elasticsearch in the product in a very advanced way uh, to allow you to search for data as well as create reporting. Um, I'm going to stop here and, and I haven't looked at any questions, so I'm happy to take uh, questions that uh, might have been uh, uh, posted. Uh, Adia would ask to um, to bring up anything that uh, was uh, yeah, there. Are was quite written. a couple. I will uh, go through some of them. Uh, okay. First, about the triggers. Uh, can trigger code update the row that triggered it? Okay, that's a that's a good question. Um, let me go back to our implementation and go back to the trigger function here. So the question is, what would have happened if here, instead of updating the data in another table, I will update the data in my own table? So the answer is, it will cause the trigger to run because I'm making a change to the data. In other words, if you update your own data here, you will go into an endless loop. But there is a much, much more, you know, much better way of doing that, and that is to utilize Broadway. If we go back to the address uh, table and we we use, we see the Broadway that is defined for it, you can use the the Broadway where you can see how the data flows and and how it operates and you can see how the data looks like on the individual row level and take action on the row, as opposed to do that in a, in a trigger in code. You can do that visually here by dragging and dropping objects. Okay, good question. Next. Also about the uh, triggers, if you can run it uh, asynchronously. Okay, so theoretically you can, meaning you can write code here that will run asynchronous activity. And even in the broad way, um, you can bring in async functionality. However, and this is important, even if you do that, it's still part of the transaction, which means that the sync of the entire instance will wait until all the async activity have completed, and then we'll define success or failure. Now, if you really wanted to do real async, you can use other jobs, meaning you can trigger a job from the code or from uh, or from Broadway or a batch activity. Jobs or, or batch that you run async will actually run async outside the trigger, meaning the trigger will complete, the uh, the instance will complete the sync while the async uh, bo uh, jobs or batches will run in the background. Okay, great if, question. If, if I may, if I may to add, hold. Uh, yes. The recommendation from uh, R and D whenever you need a synchronous mechanism to use pub sub mechanism. So you publish from your trigger and another guy, another job, whoever subscribes and does the job what you need. Correct. It's it, it, you're absolutely correct here, Ivan. That um, that if we want it to happen outside the transaction, we could use CDC for that, as opposed to trigger. It will actually be a lot more reliable and a lot safer because the data is audited in Kafka, and you can retry and and create retry mechanism um, that will run as many times as you want. Okay, next question. Can I get the logical unit instance ID inside the trigger event function? You can. Um, so 
first, depending, let me close some of the things here so we, we don't get uh, confused by too many open things here. So it, first, it depends whether you want it in the trigger or the event. Let's bring, let's open the event function. In the event function, it's actually built in. Part of the attribute that is provided to the function when an event happens includes, among other things, the instance ID. In the trigger function, in order to get the trigger ID, you can do something like this, uh, string ID. You actually have to extract it from the session itself. So you do something like fabric, uh, fetch, select, IID, it's a built-in function on the customer data product, and give me the first value and change it to two string. Okay, so we're gonna save this. We're going to deploy the customer logical unit, and we're gonna start debug. Now we're gonna go and update customer one to a different state. And here we can see the breakpoint achieved and the IID now holds one, which represents customer number one. 